Taylor Decker's on my all 22 fantasy team, by the way. Stop. Stop it. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. Taylor's I don't care, and I'm in the league. I'm just trying to hype up the future of fantasy football here. <clears throat> they told me we could hype it up. Nobody cares about your fantasy team. That's one of the uh, cardinal my rules way. of broadcasting. Regardless of the medium, they don't care. So the strategic component to this game is through the roof. Go, go, your go, predictions, go. right? Your forecasting in fantasy football into how good is this player? This is gonna, it's gonna change the industry. Yeah, yeah. I moved to the old town with goals down. Look at me now. I wrote my goals down. I hold it down. Made myself proud. Say, look at me now. Welcome to the All-22 Podcast. My name is Chris Lombardi, and I'm joined by Bobby Acker and Ray Cotto, and we are the co-founders of All-22. Guys, we're a week into the playoffs. What were you most excited about in week one? What are you most looking forward to in week two? I want to hear about it. Well, we got the bravado back, Chris, so I'm excited about that. I'll be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Dude, how could you not be excited that there's three NFC East teams still playing right now? That's pretty damn cool. Right, what do you think? What do you think your chances are? You think we get a rematch, bud? I'm, I'm hoping for a rematch so badly. Um, there was that stupid graphic on NFL Network, like comparing Dak Prescott to Brock Purdy, and it's just like, you got to be freaking kidding me. Like, please, let's just rematch the Cowboys and the Giants. The NFL should want that anyway, right? Those are big market teams. That would be a huge ratings boost anyway. So, like, yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. That's, I like the I'm, NFC. I'm, I'm hoping for it. I like the NFC. I feel like every team has a chance. The AFC, you don't feel that as much, but the, the NFC, you do. Yeah, I, I, I kind of get what you're saying. I, I don't think, like, I don't know. Maybe I'm just pessimistic, but I don't think we have as good of a chance as the other three teams. We, as in the Giants, have a very, as good of a chance as the other three teams. But, like, you never know, man. I didn't really give us much of a chance against Minnesota, but we'll see. I would love to stick it to the Eagles, man. It's funny. So, you guys know I just went to the Vikings-Giants game. And here's what's interesting, okay? In talking with Vikings fans, I find it interesting that they hate Philly fans as much as a Giants fan does, which I find very interesting. They're not even the same division. Like, you know there's something up with your fan base when, like, a team's fan base is outside of your division don't like you like that. So, yeah, I thought that was pretty interesting. At all22 underscore Bobby on Twitter. Um, I'll just let the record show that I am a Sixers fan, so there is that. Yeah, the no, Eagles are out. definitely that team, right? Come the out, Eagles man. are definitely that team. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not talking trash at all. I don't like. I don't think we're the better team, um, but we are the better fan base. That's it. That's a fact. <laughs> cool. Uh, well, with that, guys, we we released a survey this week. I just wanted to maybe comment on it really quickly. Um, if you played all 22 this year, check your inbox. We sent you a survey. It's really uh, just an opportunity for us to get your feedback. So you can tell us what you liked, what you didn't like, what you want us to improve on, what new features you want to see, um, because we're going to listen to that and we're actually going to do those things. So um, if you haven't done it yet, please try to do it before the end of this week. Uh, we would greatly appreciate that. Yeah. And props to those who did respond. We've gotten a lot of responses so far and some really good good feedback and talking points overall so it's really cool to see definitely yeah. so with go ahead yeah so with that the uh the first season of all 22 has come to an end and there's a lot to unpack over the next few weeks we will be reviewing the top performers of the 2022 season uh last episode we announced that we will be releasing a mock draft tool so in parallel while we're reviewing kind of the results of the 2022 season we're also going to be debating the rankings uh going into this like mock draft season so um, usually we go through like massive spreadsheets for our rankings and we, we're going to do that, but we'll do that like right after free agency and the NFL draft when we really know like everything we need to know to make those rankings. But for now, we're just going to kind of like yell at each other and debate this. So, uh, we thought it'd be fun to do that live. So with that, we're going to review offense today, starting with quarterbacks and uh, the reason we're doing that, because they have the highest weight, we're going to go in weight order, order. So starting with quarterbacks. Uh, this year, we saw the young guys that everybody's really rooting for uh, solidify themselves as the top dogs. So our preseason top three was Burrow, one, Allen, two, and Mahomes, three. And they actually finished those three, finished top three, but uh, flipped. So Mahomes was number one. Uh, with a 91.3 PFF grade and 112.3 all 22 points. Josh Allen, two with 112 
uh, all 22 points, and then Burrow, three with 111.7. I also wanted to just say that Allen and Burrow missed week 17. So if they had played that game, they likely would have surpassed Mahomes. Um, but it's a great season nonetheless. So guys, I wanted to ask you, start off this conversation. What about these three guys is really making them special? And do you think that they really are the top three or is anybody else, should anybody else be in the discussion with them? I, I think if you want to, if you ask me just straight up what makes them special, right? It's, it's if, like if you're watching the game, right? If you're playing against either of those three names and it's a one score game, there's less than two minutes left. It feels like if you score with more than 30 seconds on the clock, like you left them too much time to come back and score on you. It's just their playmaking ability is so special that they could just score from any part of the field at any given moment. Uh, you know, no lead is safe. They could be struggling for, you know, the first 40 minutes of the game and then just turn it on and just erase double digit deficits like nobody's business. They can make every throw. They're in, you know, good offenses, a good situation, surrounded by a lot of talent. It's, they're, they're just scary. Like, if you had to, like, define what separates the top three quarterbacks from even, you know, quarterbacks four through six or four through eight or whatever, they're just scary to play against. Yeah, I mean, that's a great analysis. I think another aspect of it is they're well-coached players with really good talent around them as well, right? Like, I think the reason if you asked us why we had Mahomes at three before the year is because this is the year that Mahomes got tested, right? He lost his top receiver. Um, he lost some other talent around him. They went and signed just a bunch of, like, more average-level receivers, and he might have had his best year ever, right? So, like... We put Mahomes at three with the the idea that maybe he was going to take a little bit of a dip, but he proved why he's number one. So let's start there, guys. Is Mahomes the number one quarterback? I mean, and Ray, or Bobby, sorry. Yeah, he's absolutely my number one quarterback. If, if we're going to the list right now, are we doing that? Um, I definitely. I'm have just going to ask you who's your number one. Yeah, I definitely have Mahomes as as my number one. I think we got that. I think we got that wrong last year bumping him down to number three. Not that we put him down to number three after somebody ridiculous, but um, I think, you know, like you said, Chris, you take away some of the tools, and I think maybe we overvalued, um, like, the impact that that would have on on Mahomes. He's just, he's just great. There's really no other way to put it. Right, and, and now I'll ask the question, Bobby. So, like, besides those three, don't give me the order yet, but is there anybody that you think – deserves to be in the conversation with them. No, I think it's Mahomes and then there's a break and then it's everybody else. Um, I think he's in a tier of his own of his own. But like again, like that's no disrespect to the other guys. He just he can do it all. I mean we we see it every Sunday. He, he can do it all and more. He does these ridiculous things and like honestly I'm not like a Mahomes fan, but it's like it's just unreal some of the things he's able to do. Yeah, he's he's amazing and totally special. And going with the the rest of the guys now, the guys that maybe you know people would talk about in that conversation, we have Herbert finished number four, Brady five, Cousins six, Geno seven, Aaron Rodgers eight, nine was Trevor Lawrence, and ten was surprisingly it was Jared Goff. Maybe not surprisingly, I don't know. Um, which of these guys are you prioritizing taking over the others? That's my next question. So, like, is there anybody on this list that you think? should be the guy that you would want to go get uh, before maybe the rest of them outside of that top three of Burrow, Allen, and Mahomes. And Ray, I'll ask you that. Yes. Um, just looking at that, at that list of names, actually going to go back and take a trip down memory lane. Episode three of this podcast. So early on in, uh, in our podcasting days, there was a clip we were discussing potential dark horse quarterbacks for the 2022 season and where they might end up at the end of the year. And I said, I wouldn't be shocked if Trevor Lawrence maybe isn't top five, but for sure could finish in the top 10 or top eight with the normal rookie ascension and getting used to the NFL. Um, and kind of mentioned how like, yeah, the Jaguars overpaid for some receivers. They don't have anybody elite for him to throw to. 
but they at least acquired some, you know, some wide receivers for Trevor as opposed to just like a totally bare cupboard. And if you remember, that was met with you, Chris, saying you couldn't wait to save that clip because that was going to be an awful one and I was going to regret saying that. That he would be top five. Yeah, I do remember that. And he's 10. So um, he's, he, he finished ninth. He finished ninth, which is smack dab between eight and 10. Mm. Yeah, Bobby, yeah, we could and also I, and I get... said he wouldn't finish top five. So, I mean, you could you could play the clip. And then, Chris, you threw out Mac Jones, just, just for the audience there. And that's, that's, that's that Mac is true. Jones. So, Bobby, maybe defend me with the 11th quarterback on the list. Bobby, defend you. Jalen Hurts. <laughs> defend yourself. What was Jaylen, Ray's take on Jalen Hurts? Jalen Hurts, the fullback, right? That's what you call him, right? The fullback? I said in college he looked like a fullback at Alabama. Yeah. No, I think we'll she find was, that. That's why he got that's benched. Not at all what you yeah, said. You can, find, you can find that clip. You can find it. <laughs> Eighty-five point nine season grade, MVP candidate this year. Still just twenty-four years old, and like you know what, Ray? I'll kind of, I wouldn't say I'll meet you in the middle, but I'll give you this. Right? I feel like his success is a lot has a lot to do with Howie Roseman, right? I feel like we have to give him some credit too, because if you look at that roster, it's it's loaded. It's loaded. Good offensive line, defense that can get him the ball. He's got a good running game around him. He's got really good receivers, good tight end. Like, he's got it all. So I think that does play into it too. But you did call him a fullback. Okay, so back to the topic at hand, right? Since week 10, Trevor Lawrence is the fifth highest graded quarterback in the NFL with the fourth highest passing grade. In that same time span, Jalen Hurts is the 16th highest graded quarterback and 19th graded passer. Could he be have gotten a bit figured out uh, later on in the year as more tape on that offense came out and how they're using him with those weapons? He also sprained his shoulder. He sprained, sprained his, his shoulder. shoulder late, though. He sprained, he sprained his shoulder. Did you, you know, say late in the year? Late in the year. We could rewind if you want. Yeah, I think he sprained his shoulder week 15 or, or actually, I think week 16 or 17. He missed two games. Look, and um, I'm not comparing back just for. Sorry, I'm not comparing like, Jalen and Trevor. That's not what I'm doing, dude. I'm just saying <laughs> you were you're right. I think you're right about Trevor Lawrence. I think you're wrong about Jalen Hurts. That's all. Two separate. Maybe. I'll give I'll give Hurts credit. He played. He definitely played better than I thought he would. He's he has improved every single Thank you. year. That's all I wanted to hear. Yeah, and I'll and I'll do the same for Trevor Lawrence. He has absolutely improved. He's having a great year. Ray, you hit that one on the head. I'll take the egg on my face. Uh, but let's move on, right? So Justin Fields was the 14th uh, ranked quarterback in our system, and he actually missed two weeks, so you'd move him up a little bit. And then there's a couple other guys that missed a lot of time, and that's Tua and Lamar. Both of them had above 80 PFF grades. Each of them easily would have finished uh, top 10 in our system had they finished out the year. Um, So now let's get into the kind of the ranking conversation. So let's take a break, and I'll ask you, Bobby, give us your – give us your – you want to give us 10 or you want to give us five? I, I got 10 for you. So I mean, the, end of, the end of it gets a little fuzzy, and I'm sure you guys will get mad, but it's cool. Okay. Number one, like I said before, Pat Mahomes, I think that's that's pretty clear. He can do everything. Um, don't have to kind of beat a dead horse there. Number two, I have Joe Burrow. Um, it's Again, it's like one of these toss-ups, Joe Burrow, Josh Allen. You can make a case for either one. In my opinion, I think Joe Burrow is the better – passer of the two his grade is slightly better than josh allen's joe burrow with a 90 passing grade this season josh allen with an 86.1 i think given that they're they're the same age i'm going to go with the passer i want the guy that's going to be that's going to stay in the pocket i want the guy that's got less risk of injury that's why i put burrow just ahead of josh allen but again you kind of make the case for either one um josh allen number three uh, I really don't like Josh Allen's offensive line. It's pretty damn bad, and I don't think it's something that you fix in one off season. So another reason why he's number three right there. Number four, I'm going Ray's boy Jalen Hurts. And again, this is more a testament to Harry Roseman than it is Jalen Hurts. I think he's in a really good situation. He's got a really good coach. As much as I really don't like him and his stuffed crust pt and ass that don't like him <laughs> um so got jalen hurts at four i think he's a really good passer he's got really good talent around him and number five ray trevor lawrence you should love that still just 23 years old i think we're seeing the best of trevor lawrence right now i think 
him and Doug Peterson, boys, I'm surprised that he didn't invite Doug Peterson to Waffle House the other night because they just seem like they're tied at the hip, which is really cool. Um, I think that's a really good situation for Trevor. And again, he's 23. Um, so I think sky's the limit for him. So I feel really good about having him in my top five. Number six, I'm going to go to, uh, and I think that's, this is kind of where it gets a little fuzzy. So I'm going to it here because I really love Mike McDaniel. Um, you kind of have to roll the dice that he's not going to get hurt as much next year, which is a big dice roll. But when he was healthy, he was the number one graded uh, one, number one graded quarterback in PFF. I think it was like week eight or nine he held that number one spot. But once he started getting the concussions, started missing time, that's when he started to drop off. So it is a dice roll, but high risk, high reward, right? Um, number seven, I go got Justin Herbert. I love Justin Herbert, the player. I'm not crazy about the situation. The fact that there was even a question that Brandon Staley might be fired. I don't really like the instability there. So that's why I have him just below Tua right there. Um, I do think that offensive line need, needs work also. So that really doesn't play too well for him. Just behind Herbert, I have Dak. Um, I think what we just saw from Dak this past weekend, um, I thought he looked really good against Tampa. I think I think this round of the playoffs, we're going to see uh, a different version of Dak that can really kill it from the pocket. Somebody's going to play a clean game. I think these last seven weeks where he's turned the ball over, I think he's I think he's going to get that out of his system. Um, number nine, I have Kirk Cousins. I know he's thirty four, but like if you go back and watch the game from this past weekend, any Vikings fan who's blaming Kirk Cousins for the loss is out of their damn mind. Other than that last pass on fourth down, not going past the sticks, his game was flawless. Kirk looks damn good. He can still make every throw. And then number 10, I got my boy, Russell Wilson, who, uh, yeah, you guys are going to hate me for, but I still got to believe it's in him. I'm so glad uh, Nathaniel Hackett's gone. So let's uh, let's see. Okay. Uh, and then just some honorable mentions here, some guys that could have made the list. Daniel Jones, Brock Purdy, Justin Fields. Brock Purdy, who knows what he does in the playoffs. Daniel Jones, same thing. And Justin Fields scares me because, you know, non-pocket quarterbacks have uh, naturally have some uh, injury injury risk. So I kind of kept him off there for that reason. Okay. Okay. Ray, now it's time for you to tell me what you think of Bobby's list. What do you think he got right? What do you think he got wrong? Let's start debating. I think once you get past, I, I, I think he might have Justin Herbert too low. I think I might swap Herbert. Too low as in like too close to the top of the list at number one? Too what? too close to the, he should be higher. So he should be, like I would have Herbert maybe say four. Like I might just fl- swap him with, with Hertz there. Oh, okay. What's your reason? Um, I think, I, I remember I go back to what I said, I think just before this season that Herbert, this might be the year where you see a little bit of a decline in his performance overall as teams sort of adjust to him after his best season in 2021, which was his second year in the league. And then from there, kind of moving forward, he'll adjust his game and, you know, send back into sort of that upper echelon of the league. It happened with Mahomes a couple of years back. It, it happens to all of them. I think that was this year, uh, you know, this past season in 2022, where he still, you know, finished, you know, with a near 80 grade there, 78.6 overall. So um, he still performed really well. And I think that was sort of his step back. And we'll see more of the 2021 or, or close to the 2021 Herbert um, than we saw, you know, moving forward than we saw in 2022. So, I think that's my reasoning overall there. Two is so hard to slot because he's one hit away from who knows what, maybe never playing again. Um, and I, it's just so tough to project that because it's just such a risk every week. And I do think because of that offense, they may be able to get another guy in there who can still perform very well. And that might not saying that they're going to bench him or, you know, trade him or, or, or whatever the case may be. But when it comes time for, you know, long-term deals and, and contract discussions and things like that, his his injury history has got to be in the back of their mind. And I just don't know how that's going to play out. 
so I'm, I'm not sure what to do with him. So I guess six is fine because after that, when you go further down that list, Dak Prescott, 29 years old, Kirk, Kirk and Russ are in the thirties. Um, I, I don't know where I'm more of a, you know, question asker here than anything else, but where would you have Deshaun Watson? Like how far below the top 10 are you slotting someone like Deshaun now that he's back on the field suspensions behind him? Are you thinking he's going to get back to form now that he's got some games under his belt and is going to be like a regular player moving forward? Or, uh, you know, what do you do with someone like that who's, you know, very talented? He's young. He's younger than everybody on the bottom half of that list just about. What do you do there? Are you asking me or are you asking Chris? Whoever feels strongly about it. <laughs> I mean, I have, an, I have an opinion, but yeah. yeah. I, I, I don't feel that strongly about it. I mean, top breaking into the top 10, he didn't really look that great coming back. I, I don't know, man. Chris, go ahead. You can take this one. Yeah. Well, I'll take, yeah, <laughs> I'll take the fuzzy ones for sure. That's my, that's my rep now, I think. So, so like I had Watson at 20 cause I made a top 20 for myself. I actually had Watson at 20 behind guys like Goff, even behind Kenny Pickett. And, you know, we didn't talk about Kenny Pickett yet, but Pickett was our top rookie. He had a really, you know, like slow start. He, If you remember, he didn't, he wasn't the starter coming into the season. So he didn't have the preseason to be the starter. But once he took the role, he was like at least consistent. But then when you looked at the, the last few games, he, he was really good. And he actually helped the Steelers finish five and one to finish the year. So like, would I rather have a guy like Kenny Pickett who has Mike Tomlin as his head coach? It's probably one of the most stable situations in football where the Steelers are always good. Or would I rather have a guy like Watson where you really have no idea what the future holds? He, he, I, I understand he came back after a real, like, you know, a lot of time off, but he looked really bad. And I think that having an entire preseason, he's going to look a lot better. But like, he looked like he was the worst quarterback in the NFL. So like me putting him at 20 is me saying he's going to look better. Do I think he could potentially be top five? Maybe not, but top 10. Yeah, absolutely. But I also feel that way about Russell Wilson. Like Bobby said, I feel that way even about Daniel Jones with what we've seen of him lately. If they give that guy some receivers. You're telling me there's no chance Daniel Jones is a top 10 guy on this list. Like it could happen. Um, Bobby, I kind of disagreed on Tua. Like I have him farther down my list because of the injury stuff. Um, but one other take I wanted to just quickly uh, say is I had Lamar in my top 10. And I wanted to ask you guys where you have Lamar, because I do think Lamar is extremely talented. If you look at how he graded this year when he was healthy, he did well. You know, I was joking on Twitter today about him not being a playoff quarterback, which still might be true. But, you know, you're playing all 22 in the regular season. He does perform really well. He's 25, six years old. Like, where does he slot for you guys? Bobby, so I, yeah, go ahead, Bobby. I mean, his grades are are pretty volatile, right? So we set up the tweet today, and I'm going through his season grades, and like, you know, his his, his MVP season, he was like a 91, right? Mm -hmm. Seasons around that, he was like in the 70s, like it, like low 80s. Like it's it's really hard to predict. And again, kind of like the same reason that I didn't have Justin Fields on this list, like the injury concerns. I want like I want somebody that can consistently win from from the pocket right and i think lamar can do that i just i don't know i feel like when he's forced to do that and like, like that's what happens in the playoffs it's it's i don't know it's a different story but yeah i just don't feel comfortable putting my top 10 because it's just really just because it's a it's a pretty volatile player he's a pretty volatile player yeah i so i have him in our inaugural league that, that we've had going for a few years now and volatile is the word it's it, another way to put it is just unreliable week to week it's pretty inconsistent as far as his grading is concerned and that's why you know from one year to the next i was uh you know competing for the conference championship and picking number one overall with lamar as my starting quarterback it's 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 too much volatility and variance for me to be comfortable putting him in my top 10 uh you know, top 12, maybe somewhere around there in that range. Uh, but with that number one pick that, that I talked about earlier, right, I did draft Trevor Lawrence. And by the time Lamar suffered his injury this past season, I was pretty much at the point where instead of, 
you know, having just Trevor as my backup, I was moving Trevor into my starting lineup by that point anyway, because there was just so much variance week to week with Lamar Jackson that you just didn't know what to expect. And, you know, there, that was no way to, to run a team and, and, you know, make a run in the playoffs. Yeah, it's tough, especially when it's 9.78%, you know what I mean? But just to, just to kind of clarify my point, it's not that I don't think Lamar can win from the pocket. Right now he's winning from the pocket because there's always that threat to run, right? You have to have somebody spying and take him out of coverage so that way, you know, you can you can account for him as a runner. When when that goes away, when he's 33, 35 years old, can he still win from the pocket? That's kind of that's kind of where I'm at with him. Is it worth a long-term investment? That's why we went back and forth today about do you pay him? Do you do you tag him and trade him? And that's why I'm in the in the in the opinion of tag him and trade him. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's end quarterback with me, uh, with the egg on my face, also admitting that Trevor Lawrence was my number fifth quarterback. And with that, we can move to receiver. So uh, receiver, 5.25% weight. So it's our second most valuable position on offense. Um, and the list is, you know, it's, it's a little different than quarterback where quarterbacks, the top guys that finished this year were the young guys we had Tyree Kill as our number one receiver with an outstanding 92.1 PFF grade and a um, 69.8 all 22 points, and that was right behind. And right behind him is Devontae Adams with a 90.1 PFF grade and 66.4 all 22 points. And then after those guys is when you start seeing the young guys come in, right? Justin Jefferson, AJ Brown, and CD Lamb rounded out our top five. Um, and those are the kind of guys you probably feel extremely comfortable drafting early and having for a long time. Uh, in the same breath, there are a bunch of other guys, though, at, on this receiver list that, like, me personally, I feel very comfortable with, right? You have Jamar Chase, uh, Jalen Waddle, T. Higgins, Metcalf, Devonta Smith, St. Brown, Debo McLaurin. Like, it is extremely uh, – it, it, it is an extremely deep group of receivers, a lot of guys that have very few flaws. So um, let's kick it off with a top 10 here. Ray, why don't you, uh, why don't you do that for us? Yeah, so – just to rank them off the top, it's I have Justin Jefferson at number one. I think the combination of age, ability, and production is just off the charts. Um, it, I, I don't think there's any question about it, really. I think he's the clear number one there. I know even heading into this year, a lot of people had Jamar Chase sort of also in that boat and, and kind of right there. But I have Justin Jefferson uh, at number one. Um, I have CeeDee Lamb at two followed by Jamar Chase at three. Um, and that may be just because of the injury and, and the time missed by by Chase there while uh, CeeDee Lamb, just recency bias, you know, really sort of took hold as the number one receiver in, in Dallas and had like one of the most quietly super productive seasons um, that, that you'll see out of a wide receiver this past year. Uh, and then to round out the top five, at four and five, I have Drake London and Garrett Wilson. I never thought, Four months ago, those guys would be in my top five. But from week 12 onward this past season, uh, Drake London was the sixth highest graded receiver in the league, and Garrett Wilson was ninth. So those are two rookies coming on strong late in the year in offensive situations that aren't really that great and should only improve, you know, moving forward here as you as you think that, uh, you know, like for the Jets, their offensive line gets healthy. And then for both of those teams, you know, uh, their quarterback position hopefully gets sorted out here. But even if it doesn't, we've already seen what they do in, uh, you know, in middling quarterback situations at best, right? So I have five and six, London and Wilson, um, or sorry, four and five, London and Wilson. And then sixth, I have Jalen Waddell. Um, you know, I just think, again, the threat to take it to the house. Um, you'll notice that top six is just super young. And so number seven, which sounds ridiculous to say because he's seventh only because his age which is 25 and a half is AJ Brown. Every other name that was mentioned to this point was like 23 years old or, or younger. I think maybe one of them might've been 24, who knows, but um, AJ Brown, again, just, I think that's like the last name in that top, top tier of receivers I'm looking at when it comes to a startup draft, for example. Um, yeah. He's still got tons of good years ahead of him. He's big physical. I mean, Bobby already touched on it with, you know, the supporting cast of, of Philly. And I think a big, big part of that is AJ Brown and how good he's been, how he's really transformed that offense. Um, 
but there's so many good ones that after seven, it's like, if I tried to do eight, nine, and 10, it was just kind of silly. Uh, I'm a big fan of Brandon Ayuk. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of competition there and uncertainty at the quarterback position for the future. So I can't put him any higher than maybe eighth, right. Or in that sort of eight to 10 range there, but I love his game. Same thing with DJ Moore. He's like slowly entering Allen Robinson territory when it comes to uh, quarterbacks that throw him the ball over his career, right? You started, you, you, when you talked about Allen Robinson, you named how all of them were just terrible, even dating back to like high school. DJ Moore is kind of in that same boat now. And it's frustrating because he's such a great player. Um, and then Devonte Smith is another one and Jerry Judy. I mean, the, the list goes on. Um, there's a ton, a ton of really good receivers in this league. And then you have the guys that aren't young, but they're not old either. So they're not young enough to be guys that you look at and go, okay, yeah, I'll keep them for the next seven years. So they're, I'm going to, you know, they're going to be in my top eight list or so, but you got guys like Chris Godwin, Terry McLaurin, uh, Amari Cooper. Um, and that's before even the old guys like Tyreek Devante and Diggs. I mean, Receiver is so deep that once you get past that first handful of names that you view as franchise cornerstone guys for your team for the next half decade or more, it's just like, dude, just pick your flavor. They're all really good. Wow. Yeah, that was a lot. And and like yeah. you, you definitely are leaning towards taking risks with uh, London and Wilson as your four and five. Bobby, I know you're a Wilson guy, but could you see either London or Wilson falling in your top five? I have, I have no problem with your top three, Ray. Like Jefferson, like Ray, I've seen you throw a football. You can go out there and throw to him, and he'll st still have 100 yards in the game. <laughs> yeah. um, see, you didn't teach me how to hold it on my birthday, so there's <laughs> yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. No, we, like, like we talk, no, seriously, though, we talk about like – you know, a three to five year plan when you're when you're doing your startup drafts, right? And this is essentially what we're doing, ranking for a startup draft. Jefferson, his quarterback's 34 years old. He's, he's going to be fine. But even if, you know, they bring somebody else in, he'll probably still be fine because he's that freaking good. Um, C.D. Lamb, he's good for the next three to five years. Dak's still just 29. Obviously, Jamar Chase is fine. Okay, now we get into Drake, London, and Garrett Wilson, which Chris is just asking me about. So, like... I don't know. I, I really don't trust Atlanta's quarterback situation to put Drake London ahead of a guy like like Jalen Waddle right now. I I don't. I don't the same thing with Garrett Wilson. Like, are they really going to roll the dice on Zach Wilson again next year? Like you said, Ray, there's a lot of good receivers, and it's not it's nothing against these guys, but like like we've learned about PFF grades over the year, a lot of it has to do with the volume of targets that they're getting and the quality targets that they're getting. And I just can't bank on either of those two guys getting good quality, good quantity targets over the next few years. Not that they're not good players. I'm sure, you know, in either the, either Jefferson, CD, or Jamar's situation, I would have no problem with those guys being in the top five. But being on the Jets, being on the Falcons, I just can't justify putting them there. Yeah, and I, I'm not going to say anything like – brass about it because I do think that they're good players and they proved themselves already. But, you know, there's guys that I don't I hadn't heard mentioned almost at all that are actually in my top ten that again you didn't even mention. So like what about what about guys like T. Higgins, DK Metcalf, and Devonta Smith? Like where do those guys fall on your list? So I did mention Devontae Smith kind of as like an honorable mention there mm -hmm. at, at the end of the top ten. Like he was kind of thrown in there with like 15 other names because there's so many receivers. So like don't blame me for missing it. Uh DK was a little inconsistent, you know, week to week mm -hmm. there. So I kind of have him more in like that 15 to 17 range, which is still really good. I just didn't really number outside of like, once I got past that, you know, sort of cluster up to 12 or 13 or so. Um, but yeah, that, that just, that's another one. DK is up there. It just kind of goes to the, the point. And if you're looking at this receiver overall, overall you, I, I kind of wonder if you look at that and go, maybe I just don't take any early on. I sportify some other positions and then just come back to it. And I can grab a Chris Godwin later on in the draft who will be good for me for, you know, two to three years A Mike Williams, maybe right. Uh, so many guys like that. If you just go down the list, we could probably name up to 30 or more, right? Stefan Diggs, Devonte Adams, who are, you know, guys who are 29, but are still going to give you another two years at least of really quality play. It's yeah, it's, it's an abundance of goods at receiver in, in the NFL right now. And then there's one other guy that you didn't mention that I just wanted to bring up because he's an older guy, 
but neither of you mentioned Cooper Cup. And Cooper Cup last year was the number one receiver in our system. This year he was top five before he got hurt. He is turning 30. So, like, where where do you feel confident taking a guy like that or putting him on this list? First of all, don't come after me, okay? I didn't add people to the list. I'm just criticizing the list itself. Sure, but, sure, yeah. sure. <laughs> but I think if you take a strategy like Ray just said where, like, you don't draft receivers up front and you kind of come back and get them later on, I feel mm-hmm. like in that range is where I'd put Cooper Cup. It's a guy that, you know, for the next couple of years is going to get you really consistent grades. And it kind of buys you some time until you can get your own C.D. Lamb, your own Garrett Wilson, whoever it is. I might have to wait till the 2024 draft for that one, but <laughs> we'll see how that shakes out. <laughs> and as a Packer fan, like I know I said that was the last one, but as a Packer fan, I really need to ask like where Christian Watson is on this list for you, Ray. Because I mean, <sighs> he did it, you know, the last few weeks, he was really good in PFF grading and all 22 scoring. And, and Isaiah Hodgins, let's 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 add him in there too. Where right, is he? Yeah. So and yeah, so Christian Watson. Um, <laughs> let's just. I need to see more of it. I, I still need to see more. Um, let's see what happens. I mean, it's going to be a, a a weird off season for the Packers, right? Regardless of what happens there, but you know there could be a shift in quarterback and offensive philosophy overall. Uh, let's see him for a few more games into 2023 with whatever that situation is going to look like. Let's see how that impacts him if it does, and if he continues kind of his his hot streak that he had in the second half of the year, I, I think he, he's top 20 for sure and maybe above that. Okay. All right. Well, with, with that, let's move to tackle. Tackles yeah. are – Let's gloss third. over Isaiah Hodgins and move to tackle. Let's do that. Cool. <laughs> do you want to say something about Isaiah Hodgins? No, just that I love him. Let's move on. <laughs> All right. So uh, tackles the third most valuable position in our system on offense, 5.18% uh, weight. So with that, Trent Williams, our preseason number one, missed time dealing with an injury. When he was healthy, he was still by far the best tackle in football. His 93 PFF grade was a full 2.7 points over any other tackle in the system. And the next guy, season grade, is uh, someone who really impressed us but was a little bit lower, right? We had him as our preseason number 29 tackle, and that's Christian Derisau. Uh, he and Brian O'Neill really helped take the Vikings to the top of the NFC North. Uh, Bobby, you know, like you got to see what that that team became this year, uh, watching them this weekend in the playoffs. Um, you know, it, they they, trans, they helped transform that team. So wanted to mention those three guys first. Um, and then another guy out of the North that I wanted to mention is Penai Sewell. Um, followed up his really promising rookie season with another great one. His 62.1, all 22 points were good for second amongst all tackles. So um, just wanted to kind of start there. Uh, there's a lot of other guys. So, you know, Tristan Wirfs, Andrew Thomas, like those are guys that you have to feel really confident about. Um, Bobby, like how are you starting to build your top five? Like what what guys from this group, because there is a lot of really good young tackles, similar to receiver. How are you starting to build this group? I mean, the first one, clear cut. Easy pick, Andrew Thomas, no doubt. Okay. I mean, you guys kind of saw that coming, right? Naturally, yep. Yeah. Still just 23 years old, and, like, he's, like, the one tackle in the league where I will not really follow the ball. I'll just watch him because it's so much fun just to see him straight up bully edge rushers, just bully them. Um, So he's been fun. He's my clear-cut number one overall. Um, I do have Christian Darasaw as second – I, again, like you just touched on, Chris, I saw him this weekend, and he was super impressive. Also 23 years old, jumped from, a, I think, like a 71 grade to a 90 grade this year. So he's been ridiculous. I don't think I don't think he dips back down. I think he just kind of keeps trending in the same direction, just like I think Andrew Thomas does. Um, number three, I have Tristan Wirfs, another 23-year-old, years, three year old. Um, kind of keeping it young at tackle because I think you can – I don't think Tristan Wirfs dips down, even if Brady leaves. I know, Chris, we've talked before. You give Brady a lot of credit for Tristan Wirfs' success, which is fair. But I do think that he sustains and he keeps this spot moving forward without Tom Brady. I'm assuming Tom Brady's leaving. Um, number four, you touched on it before, Chris, Penai Sewell. Love Penai Sewell. I think he makes a jump just like Kristen Darasaw did. I think I think Panay Sewell graded like an 81, 82 for the 2022 season. I can see him jumping up into the 90s, um, kind of getting that spike in his grade just like Darisaw. And then number five was actually a guy that dipped down this year, but 
but not too far, still like a 70, high 70 grade. Um, it was Jordan Mailata. Love Jordan Mailata. Again, not crazy about his team, but he's got a really good unit around him. Um, and I think that Mailata can get back up into the high 80s like he was when we first ranked him in this game last year. So that rounds out my top five. Just want to kind of mention some other guys that like we could talk about, but maybe they're a little bit older and don't make this list. That's the only reason why Caleb McGarry, somebody who kind of came alive this season at 27 years old, Laramie Tunzel, who's been solid, 28, Colton Miller, who's 27, he's also been really solid. So I think those guys kind of dip into the, you know, six to 10 range. Um, but I feel re really good about the top five, having some young guys there. Sure. And I, I yeah, Caleb McG McGarry, I wanted to mention him because him and Jake Matthews, kind of a similar story, right? Like guys that are really helping to elevate their team. Um, that team probably wouldn't, wouldn't even have won a couple games if it wasn't for guys like that. That offensive line was like the strength of that team. So um, McGarry actually finished as our number one tackle this year, just with his consistent play. He didn't miss any time. Um, so that was, you know, a big success for him. Uh, one guy that you didn't mention that I know Ray's a huge fan of is uh, Ray. Who am I going to say? Sean Slater. Yeah. yeah. Bobby, come on. Yeah, no, absolutely. So. Absolutely. <laughs> it, he, he was like tough at the five spot, like kind of like deciding between him, those two, but I really do like Jordan Malata. And that's, I don't know, just a personal preference. I could see you want to make any arguments, not going to fight you on it. Yeah. So, so the thing that I love most about Rashawn Slater, right, is in 2021, he was the only rookie to grade out in the top 10 of all tackles uh, as a rookie. And then in the first three weeks of 2022, before he went on IR, he was the third highest graded tackle on the year. So he was on his way to, in my opinion, solidifying a top three at worst, uh, you know, positioning in his, you know, in his position for the, for the, rest of his career, maybe even, I mean, he's so young too. That's another 23 year old, um, uh, which seems to be a theme on this list. So I think he gets back to that. I mean, there was talk of him returning, uh, for the playoffs, even out, you know, coming back from his injury that, uh, so he'll be fine for 2023 and beyond. It was an upper body injury, so he should be fine moving forward. And I think gets back to that form to where everybody goes, Oh yeah, duh. I get it. He was playing for the chargers and he was out the whole year. So we kind of forgot about him, but, Rashawn Slater is a top three tackle in the NFL. Um, outside of that, I do like Tunsil. I think another one where a lot of us just kind of wrote him off a bit too early. Um, he had three really solid se seasons before a down year in 2021. So we kind of, you know, Texans, whatever. He's just going to go into the abyss. But he was the number one rated pass blocker in the entire league this year. Um we talked about how he might help someone like Kenyon Green, and it, it's almost like Kenyon Green ended up helping him somehow while Kenyon Green graded just terribly as a rookie. Uh, but another name I want to throw out there, uh, or at least talk a little bit more about, is Braxton Jones. So he finished as the 10th rated run blocker in the league this season, and the Bears offense is going to run way more than they pass as they're built today. So to perform that well as a rookie – in run blocking, right? I think in that offense is a big plus for Braxton Jones moving forward. So, you know, he wasn't talked about pre-draft after the draft. Everything was about those big three offensive tackles with Iquanu, Neal, and Cross. And I think Braxton Jones is situated to do pretty well moving forward here, especially if that offense philosophy holds in Chicago. It's a good point. And I think this rookie class looked a lot more like what a traditional rookie class looks like at tackle. Like we, we've gotten so used to guys like Tristan Wirfs and Penai Sewell coming into the league and just being amazing. Right. And this class wasn't that like, there are guys that still showed a lot of promise, but they're not those guys. Right. And I think Braxton Jones is a good example of one of those. He's going to be a really solid tackle. I don't, I don't think he's ever going to be one of those guys. Um, but another guy I wanted to talk about was Tyler Smith because uh, I have a cousin who's a Cowboy fan as well. And he knows like, you know, I do all 22. So he's sending me Tyler Smith clips all the time. And I literally just get to see him destroying people like almost every single game. And I see a lot of like Penn I Sewell similarities where like he can get to open field and just take somebody out. Um, and that's rare to have somebody that big, that athletic step in. Uh, to to a winning football team early and and do what he did. So just wanted to mention him. 
Um, is there any other rookie guys you guys wanted to mention as possibilities cracking your top 10? Evan Neal sure wouldn't just to kind of touch on a point you guys made before about them kind of struggling this year. Mm-hmm. 18 passing pass blocking grade this past week. So I think that it's a little scary. Um, but yeah, maybe Abraham Lucas. I mean, but I, I don't know about putting him top 10. There's a lot of good guys. The only reason I wouldn't write off Evan Neal is because we saw a struggling Andrew Thomas turn into yeah. one of the best tackles in the league. Absolutely. And he looked very bad early on in his career too. So I'm actually a little more concerned with Evan Neal and, and the the injury history there with the hip and the knee. And the, the, it, so it was a little something with him. Um, but I wouldn't be shocked. Yeah, he, he played poorly this year. And not that it was unexpected because he is a rookie, but we saw that development with Andrew Thomas. So it shouldn't come as a surprise if 24 months from now, Evan Neal made his way into the top 10, top 12 of, of all offensive tackles in the league either. Yeah, I wouldn't say I'm like overly worried about him, but I, I, until you see some of it, you're not putting him in the top 10. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you're not starting him when they play the Cowboys if Mike Parsons is over there. So there's that. Yeah. The other thing I wanted to just mention, right? So like, Bobby, you mentioned it before. When you're drafting in this dynasty format, you're thinking three to five years. Last mm-hmm. year, we, and this was a little bit my influence, I'll, I'll admit it. We put Trent Williams as the number one tackle in this because we said he probably does have three years and you're going to get like an elite level of play for maybe two of them and then above average play, maybe the third. Yeah. Um, now we're a year removed from that, right? We saw some injury stuff, but when he was on the field, he was still elite. I had him still at like number six or seven. How how close are we on this? Or do you think it's that's insane? You you have him outside of the top ten, or would you take him right around there as well? I don't think it's insane. I mean, he graded a, a ninety three this year, which I think mm-hmm. that's actually a dip from last year, which is crazy. Yeah. Um, but I think if you're, it depends on how you're building your team. If you're building your team to win. Right now, if you're not, if you're more on the three year side than you are the five year side, then yeah, he's absolutely a top 10 pick. No brainer. Um, but I know when we put these, these lists together, we're, we're thinking long term um, or more, more towards long term. So it's the only reason why I don't have him here. But yeah, that's how you're building your team. He makes a lot of sense. I wouldn't question the pick at all. Cool. All right, let's jump to guard. So guard is the next position uh, weight-wise on the offense with 3.8% weight. Uh, and we were just talking about Caleb McGarry and Jake Matthews being vets to build around. But Chris Lindstrom might have been the best offensive lineman in Atlanta last year, right? Tw- he's not even 26 years old. He finished with not not the top guard grade. He finished with the top PFF grade of any player in their system. He had a 95 grade this year. Um, his, his 52.5, all 22 points are 4.3 points over the next highest guard, which is insane considering it's only 3.8%, right? That means he finished an entire game more than any other guard in our system, which is insane. Uh, and guard is a really tough position. So, um, when you, when you're, when you're looking at guard, you're looking for consistency. If you can find that you want to get it early, right? So Joel Petonio is a guy, right? He was our preseason number five and he finished, um, second Michael on we knew he was our actual preseason number one and he finished a third. And then after that, right, there's guys like Zach Martin, Shaq Mason, a couple of guys that, you know, uh, have been doing well for a long time. Martin probably should be in the hall of fame conversation at some point soon. And then, you know, a young guy like Robert Hunt finishing on this list. I think he was eighth, just getting so much better year over year. And now he's got Mike McDaniels bringing out the best in him. Uh, So just some guys I wanted to mention. And then I wanted to mention kind of like a disappointing one, right? Quentin Nelson, he was our number three preseason guard. And it's not an exaggeration to say that it it was a disappointment from him, even, you know, because the whole Colts team was disappointing. But he finished below 70 with his season grade for the second year in a row. Um, and this is a guy that people literally were saying is a surefire Hall of Famer when he was drafted and started his career on that track. Uh, so definitely disappointing there. Um, and then Wyatt Teller, another guy, a little bit disappointing. He was our number two guard, disappointed this year. He missed some time in the middle of the season, came back, but I, I don't think he was maybe ready for that. So his 70 season grade was the lowest that he's had in a few years as well. So, Ray, I'm going to ask you to start kind of ranking these guys. Tell us what your top five is. And I understand that this is like a really hard one. So I might cut yeah. you some slack. 
guard is by for you know by far the toughest one. Uh, I have Lindstrom, Chris Lindstrom at number one. Um, his overall grades have improved steadily each season, and he's not playing in a cheat code offense. This isn't a, a Shanahan offense, a McDaniel uh, type scheme, or anything like that. He's simply just getting better and winning his battles, and he's improved every single year. So. Um, you know, he's not in a cheat code offense, not in a cheat code situation. You know, it's not like he's surrounded by a bunch of studs either. So I think he's the clear number one at age 25, young, ascending. He's checking every single box. I think you got to have Lindstrom uh, number one overall. Number two is Michael Onwenu, who's also 25 years old with three really solid seasons in a row now under his belt, just graded a, sh- a shade under 80 for the year um, and was the third highest at his position. Um, in a situation that was pretty messy in New England, that whole offense was just a mess the entire year. They're going to bring in a new coordinator, maybe you know settle things down and get things organized there. That can only help, I would say, moving forward. And then I still have Quentin Nelson at three, despite the two down seasons in a row. 2021 was easy to explain because he had the the, the foot injury, right? And and you kind of give him a pass, say, well, he was never fully healthy and so forth. Uh, this year was just bad. Um, there's not much more you can really say. So this is more of a pick just based purely on what we've seen before. And we know how high his ceiling is and how well he can play as opposed to anything he's done for us lately. So if he doesn't have a really good season in 2023, I think that ranking is going to drop pretty darn hard, uh, when we do this in another 12 months or so. So, um, He's holding steady just because I think natural talent-wise, he's still the number one guy at this position in the league. We just have to see it because if we go three years in a row without it, then uh, at that point, you just have to wonder if he's the same guy that that he was before 2021. So um, holding steady there at three, but it's teetering. Uh, Trey Smith is who I have at four. Um, you know, loved him out of college. He was a great prospect that fell because of some medical condition. I don't recall if it was like a blood clot or something like that. So uh, Kansas City got an absolute steal with him. Um, he was the second highest rated guard in the league after Chris Lindstrom um, from week 10 onward. And he's just 23 years old with back-to-back 70-plus graded seasons to start his career. Obviously, as a Kansas City Chief, he's in a great offense, surrounded by a lot of talent and a great quarterback as a whole to keep that whole thing humming. So um, love his profile moving forward um, and and really like him there in the top four. And then I do have Robert Hunt in the top five. He doesn't just catch screen passes for touchdowns. He's a really good player in a really good scheme. Um, His grades have improved every single year to start his career um, and was the seventh highest scoring guard in our game this past season. So He's a bit inconsistent. Like he went on like a month long cold stretch following the Dolphins bye week where he had four games in a row uh, in the fifties. So I think that brought down his, his season grade, which could have been much, much higher if it wasn't for that cold spell. So young player, a little inconsistent, but if he kind of straightens that stuff out, um, I think he can, you know, he can be a big time player for you in all 22 at a position that's really not that deep. Um, And so, yes, I didn't mention Zach Martin, you touched on Joel Batonio. Um, and I know guards can play into their 30s. They have more longevity than other positions. But I'll let someone else do that as, you know, sometimes a 33-year-old, still a 33-year-old, even if they're a guard, they will start to decline. Um, so I have those guys up there. I guess I'd put Zach Martin at six, maybe Wyatt Teller at seven, uh, followed by Batonio as well. But um, they, they just missed the top five for me. So have at it guard stuff. And that's, uh, that's, that's my essay I'm handing in. Bobby, what do you agree with? What do you disagree with? Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's another tough year for guards. And I feel like that's kind of been a trend, right? Like we had two guys grade above an 85 and then everybody else was like an 80 or below, which like is, is pretty wild to see such a severe drop off. Honestly, if it's me, I understand your points about Joel Batonio not being in your top five. But if you look at his last three seasons, he graded 85, 90, 85, 87. So it's like uh, he's still 31. I get it. But I'm still probably drafting him in the top five just because it's the best you can really do. Um, albeit it's a low-value position. Um, I think if you can get that guy and people are waiting on him because he's old, take advantage of that right away. Um, Quentin Nelson still being in your top five. I mean, he'd also be in mine. 
I don't think he'll be ranked that way when we when we finally do this because of how bad the season was. Um, and I think he's going to be a steal from some people that are going to sleep on him. They're going to see his 2022 season grade, and they're going to just kind of look him over. So um, I get why you have him. Um, probably put Batonio right behind him. Um, Trey Smith, I love. Uh, I'm not going to really make any changes there. Um, yeah, man. I mean, Quinn Miners is another guy who's like really young, and we just saw him grade really well. I feel like I'd probably put him – above Robert Hunt, maybe at that five spot. But yeah, I mean, it's a, it, like you said, Ray, it's a, it's a really tough position to, uh, to rank. Yeah. And I, so like the only disagreement I would have with what you said, Ray, is like, I actually think this is the perfect position to take a risk on some of those older guys, right? Like a Zach Martin, because, because there's not great young players behind him. You know, it's different than receiver, right? Like I totally understand waiting on Cooper cup because you want to get a, um, like a St. Brown, right? Because, because there's a young guy like that, that's, that's producing. He's more of a sure thing. I think a guard with what we're seeing with some of these guards after Lindstrom and on, we knew there's so much risk. So I'm probably going Lindstrom on, we knew Petonio, Martin hunt and Nelson as my top six. And, you know, like, like Bobby said, I think there's a few other young guys after Smith and hunt that we could throw in here. Um, but like guys like Ezra Cleveland, Austin Corbett, uh, James Daniels, there, there's a few guys that I really like. So um, I think there's a little bit more depth than we're giving it credit for, but um, I'm probably going to try to go with those veterans. I'll throw one more name out there too, before we move on for the listeners that a lot of people might've forgotten about, but Elijah Vera Tucker, before he got hurt for the Jets, promising young player that was doing pretty well, but like everyone else on the Jets offensive line was on IR in the first half of the season. So we kind of forgot about him, but that's, that's another potential one where I didn't see enough to get him on my list, but he could be there this time next year. Yeah. It's a good, that's a good one. I definitely missed that. All right. Let's move to running back with 3.44% weight. Uh, we talked about this a lot last year, but I just wanted to bring the point up again that our running back rankings are not going to look vastly different than what your typical fantasy running back rankings look like, right? Because so much of what running backs do is like, or how they're judged is when the ball's in their hand, right? So much of their value comes from those moments. So things that equate to them producing yards and touchdowns is going to produce to them having a good PFF grade. So we actually saw the top five as Josh Jacobs, Nick Chubb, Aaron Jones, Austin Eckler, and Christian McCaffrey, right? So like, I don't think anybody's going to really argue with that if you um, if you played fantasy football at all this year. So it's really um, Josh Jacobs I wanted to touch on, just like leading the NFL in rushing yards, right? But he also led it in PFF grade, and he also led it in all 22 points this year. So pretty cool there. Um, and it's uh, interesting because all of the positions we're going through, right, we're talking about the young guys coming up and doing really well, and running back is the position that that's supposed to be most true for. And then the list of guys I just gave you are, are guys that are more on the older side, right, at their position, relatively for their position, right? Like McCaffrey's still 25 years old, but for a running back, that's like, he's got like two years left probably, right? So um, just thought that was interesting, something to point out. And then our preseason number one was Jonathan Taylor. The Colts were a mess this year. And then Jonathan Taylor on top of that had injuries. That offensive line play was terrible. Decision-making by the coaches was terrible. So uh, not sure how people feel about that. But two other really young, good running backs also dealt with injuries, and that's Brees Hall and Javante Williams. So um, our rankings kind of got, like, thrown out the window at running back. Um, Bobby, if you're going into next year, how are you looking at this group, and what would your top five look like? Yeah, like you said, Chris, like, if, if we were to show you our final, like, the rankings at the end of the year and the beginning of the year of this year, it would look really strange. So – my top five is probably going to look a little strange. This is a really tough position to to get right. Um, number one, I have well, – before I get into that, Chris, you and I touched on a little bit, bef- little bit before the podcast, right? Some of the things I look at when I r- rank my running backs, obviously the, obviously the talent, right? That's clear-cut number one. But also the situation. Situation as far as like coaching staff, stability there, offensive line. Want to make sure it's the right situation for your guy. So while Josh Mm -hmm. Jacobs, I think he's an incredible talent, I think his situation is a complete mess right now. 
speaking out against the team. No one really knows what's going on there in, in Las Vegas with their, their quarterback situation. They can't really afford to fire their coach, but it seems like they would want to if they could. So things like that kind of play into my rankings here. So number one, I have Christian McCaffrey. We just saw the Niners trade a good amount to get Christian McCaffrey, and they know how to use him and use him very well. Um, Christian McCaffrey in another year in Shanahan's offense, that's super exciting. Um, similar to him, um, I have Saquon Barkley at number two. He's now finally in an offense that knows how to use him. He's been, I mean, healthy so far this year. It looks really good. So definitely have him at number two. Tony Pollard coming in at number three for me. Seems like um, seems like McCarthy likes him a little bit more than Zeke. And like, can you blame him? He definitely looks like the better back there. And it's it's really nothing against Zeke. I think Tony Pollard is really good, and Zeke's getting a little bit older. Um, number four, I have Kenneth Walker. Um, obviously, putting a second round pick into a running back from uh, Pete Carroll, it's a bold move, but it looks like it's paying off. And they're making damn sure it looks like it pays off because they, they put such a significant investment behind them. Um, and number five, it was kind of a toss up for me between Nick Chubb and Jonathan Taylor. Um, I like Jonathan Taylor a little bit better as a player, and that's why I have him as number five. But if you guys want to debate who goes there, that's, you know, I completely get it. Um, Jonathan Taylor's offensive line might not be a year away from, you know, being a solid O-line in front of him. Maybe Chubb's a little bit better. So I probably, I probably put Chubb here at number five. I think his quarterback situation a little bit better. Offensive line's a little bit better. And uh, we'll see what they end up doing um, with their coaching staff. Jeff Saturday comes back as the head coach for Indianapolis. There's really not many players I'm going to touch in Indianapolis, I'll be honest with you. But, yeah, that's my, my list. CMC, Saquon, Tony Pollard, Kenneth Walker, and Nick Chubb. Ray, how do you feel? I can't argue with it because it's it's kind of a crapshoot. I mean, definitely McCaffrey at one, I think, between his talents and now being in San Francisco, I think that helps big time. You'll never get an argument from me having Saquon that high. Uh, Tony Pollard, I, if, if Dallas is smart there, they'll probably tag him and release Zeke and try to you know save some money there given his contract numbers. So if he stays in that situation and gets a bigger role, for sure, um, I would have Tony Pollard that high. Um, agree with the reasoning on Walker and Chubb. I had that same debate, and I think for those very reasons, right, a little bit more – it's crazy it sounds stability for the Cleveland Browns and the Indianapolis Colts right now. Um, and then Deshaun as well. Remember he's, he's a threat with his legs, which only opens up the running game even further for guys like that, right? Running backs are usually the beneficiary um, in those types of situations. So uh, we kind of saw that with how the Ravens were able to just kind of plug and play these, these running backs off the street while JK Dobbins was injured and just kind of have like a round Robin of backs. there still producing. So um I think that factor for Nick Chubb keeps him at the bottom half of that top five there and keeps him on the list. Um, agree, Jacob's situation is unstable. I I am fading Derrick Henry. I don't like the personnel overall on the Titans. I think that roster is on the downswing while Derrick Henry's only getting older. Um, don't love it there. I think a, a, a rookie in this upcoming draft class is going to, break this list this time next year, whether it's B. John Robinson, I love Jameer Gibbs. I mean, the running back class this year is actually very, very good. And I think it comes at a good time because as you mentioned, there was a lot of opportunity for young backs in the league to really take hold. Uh, and they never really did. Not that any one of them is going to be overthrown by a rookie. Like I don't see the the Jets or the Broncos, for example, you know, drafting one highly or anything like that. But um, I think when you see, uh, guys like Rashad White and Isaiah Pacheco kind of fill the void at that position. That just kind of goes to show you that there's there's an opportunity there for talent to come in and take over at that position. Um, so I think a rookie, depending on where they're drafted in the situation, is going to crack this top five. So I don't really have much of a problem um, with the list here. Um, I would feel strongly about Aaron Jones being in that top five, but again, with the uncertainty that we mentioned about Green Bay and what that's going to look like. Did Rogers play his last game there? And, um, you know, how that all is going to shake out. What's the timeshare look like with AJ Dillon? 
I can't fight strongly about having him here on the list, though I do think he's definitely in the top 10 for sure, at least for next year. Um, other than that, I, I really don't have much of a problem with this list. I think it's, I think it's pretty solid. Yeah, I would, I would like, I'd make arguments for uh, Kenneth Walker to be higher. I think I had him at number two on my list. I really like his situation and like the fact that they have so many draft picks to continue to make that situation better only makes me like him more. Um, you guys know I'm a huge Najee fan, so Najee was number four on my list because he is still relatively young. Um, we don't we didn't mention any of his offensive linemen in the top ten for good reason because they're not great, but that is a well coached team, and I think that the offensive line will just continue to improve because those young guys will get better in that system. Um, besides that, maybe Etienne cracks in here at some point. I I don't know. Um, and then, yeah, there's definitely going to be a rookie or two in here. Uh, I purposely didn't include any rookies on any of my lists just because there's so much unknown. We don't even know what team they're going to be on, right? But I guess let's ask the question now. Besides B. John and Gibbs, is there any other position you can on offense that you can see a rookie cracking our top five? Top, top five for top me, five. no. Top five for me, no. E- even at running back, probably not. But top mm-hmm. ten, absolutely, and it's and it's probably only running back. Yeah, I don't think so. I'm just going through the list in my head. Like no quarterback, no receiver. This isn't this isn't a great class at receiver, tight ends. That's that's not going to happen. Yeah, I think only running back is the possible possibility there. Okay, I think there's a receiver that was at Pittsburgh, transferred to USC that I'm a huge fan of. I think he reminds me so much of like a Devonta Smith, Justin Jefferson hybrid kind of guy. And uh, he's kind of like one of those guys that like, I would put my name, I would put my name in the hat saying like, I think he's a blue chip and I don't think anybody else does. Um, I could see him cracking the top 10 as probably my only other player on offense. Uh, People would argue Michael Mayer, the tight end, but we didn't get there yet. But uh, the Notre Dame tight end uh, is getting a lot of good reviews. People really like him. Probably the highest rated tight, like pure tight end we've seen um, in the last maybe five, 10 years. Uh, Kyle Pitts being more of like a wide receiver. People like Michael Mayer is more of like a, you know, like a traditional tight end. So there's a chance that somebody would argue him. Brock Bowers, the year after is already going to be better, so. Yeah, yeah, potentially. If, if Mayer's top 10 after his rookie year, that just says more about the tight ends in the league than it than it does him. But we'll get there. It's good to yeah, we'll transition into our tight end rankings, right? Perfect. So let's do that. Uh, Tra- it's funny because like, we don't have to say much. Travis Kelsey's a cheat code. If you had him, again, similar to what you did in traditional fantasy, who's a cheat code here. Uh, he was the highest graded tight end this year. Um, similar to Lindstrom at guard, Kelsey had a massive point differential between him and the next guy, which was TJ Hawkinson. Uh, and that difference was 6.7 points, which means that it was almost two games different. Travis Kelsey was almost two games better than the next best tight end, which is just insane. Um, people have been waiting for that TJ Hawkinson breakout. I feel like it sort of came, but it also sort of didn't. And again, kind of to raise point, it might just be because of how poor the tight end play in the NFL has been. Um, after that, like, I really like Pat Fryermuth. You know, the year that he's, he had was pretty incredible. Um, he would have been our actual tight end, two had he not missed a couple of uh, weeks earlier in the season. But he did have some really big weeks with 90-plus graded games, so I'm really liking that. And then everybody's preseason favorite, Cole Kement, really did break out for a 23-year-old. We don't see that kind of play from 23-year-olds that often. Uh, so really excited to see that there. Uh, and then just Mark Andrews, who was our dynasty tight end number one, he played injured almost the entire season and still finished with an 80.3 PFF grade. Uh, he missed mo- multiple weeks, finished as our tight end 16, but y- you got to love a guy like that, right? Because even if you have Mark Andrews and you're upset that he's hurt, he's still going out there and playing for you and he actually played really well. He, did, he maybe wasn't Travis Kelsey, but he didn't leave you with just this massive hole at tight end. So pretty exciting there. Um, and then George Kittle, our dynasty tight end three, kind of a similar story, finished with an 82 year, uh, overall grade, but missed a couple weeks with injury and is still probably battling some of that. Um, so yeah, so Ray, what do you make of this tight end group? How would you start building your top five? Yeah, I'm still staying with Mark Andrews as as number one. Um, you know, 
same type of deal where he's maybe a slightly lesser cheat code than Travis Kelsey, but when healthy, he's right there. Uh, with the difference being he's what seven or eight years younger, uh, so he's got a lot more time in the league. Um, you know, looking at Baltimore, right? There's still some uncertainty now around that offense. What's it going to look like? Is Lamar coming back? Who's going to be the coordinator? This, that, and the other. But he's so well rounded that whatever happens, it won't really change much for him. He's elite, whether it's getting open down the seam or in the middle of the field, uh, in the passing game, or if he's just knocking someone's head off. Um, you mentioned he's tough, solid, he's dependable. So, you know, between all that plus his age, I have him number one uh, overall for tight end. Number two, I have Pat Fryermuth, um, super well-rounded. And in the second year, he was already, what, top four, top three in, in scoring in his position for our platform. Uh, the blocking will get more consistent. I know he, he had some shoulder issues that he was dealing with early on. Um, he was a badass blocker in college, so that's going to come. Uh, there's there's no issue there. And, again, second year in the league, he's already producing at a high level at a position that takes a lot of time. Um, and then right behind him, I have – Kyle Pitts at three. Um, he's still a freakazoid. He had an 80 season grade as a rookie and then was in the 70s this past season before landing on IR. Um, and depending on what Atlanta does for their offense, uh, you know, if, if they go more, you know, if they fix that quarterback situation and, and just get things right, we talk about the quantity and quality of targets there. That could result in a huge boon for Kyle Pitts, given his profile as a receiver more than anything else. He's already grading really well in a situation that's not so great. So if it gets better and tailored more to his strengths, um, he can move up and potentially be the number one guy in a year or two. Um, but for right now, I would have him and Fryermuth pretty interchangeable, uh, just given that they're still young, performing well, and you know we'll just kind of see as they continue towards their peak how that shakes out. And then Hawkinson I have at four. Uh, he's doing everything right. You kind of touched on it earlier. It's like a, like a semi breakout. Um, I just think that the potential of the previous three or previous two names in particular, sort of given their youth, give them a bump over Hawkinson, even though he's only like 25 years old too. Um, I think if he played the giants every week, he could be number one because he graded out in the mid eighties and then, uh, over 90 overall during the wild card weekend. Um, and he kind of did that in two different ways, right? I think the first time he had that big game, it was essentially because he was like a natural answer to the blitz that what Wink Martindale just sends like the house and just goes crazy um, with what he schemes up over there. So tight ends naturally are sort of the, um, you know, the bailout in those situations there. So he got the volume and the opportunities. But then in the wild card game, it was more so him just winning his matchups and winning his reps one on one. Um, so I think that kind of gives a glimpse into his potential as he settles in in Minnesota in that offense. So I like him as number four. And then Travis Kelsey's number five, just due solely to age and nothing else because all else equal, I think he's number one on the list. If you're going to hone in that one game, would you rather get beat by Hawkinson or get beat by Jefferson? You know what I mean? Uh, I'm making Hawkinson beat me every single time. Right. Jefferson is great. <laughs> Uh, 46 yards and one touchdown. Yeah. Great. Just, well. ma just making a point. Keep going. That just goes to my point that like, okay, as he gets into this offense and people focus on Jefferson, that's just going to help Hawkinson even more. So no, thank you for that. I, honestly, man, I agree with having him in the top five. If, if this is where Chris, if this is where you want to hit the conversation. Um, I totally agree with having Hawkinson in top five. Cause he was really, really impressive. I, I turned to Vikings, Vikings fans. I'm like, I can't believe the Lions traded you this guy, the Lions. But anyway, I don't have a problem with him. Um, believe it or not, I do have a problem with Pitts, okay? So, like, Ray, you call him a, a freak, right? What have we seen him do that's freakish? Like, we really haven't seen anything. It's been kind of lukewarm. So, I feel like until you see it, I, I can't justify trapping him as a top five tight end. Six to ten, absolutely, but top five, no. Um, I have a problem with Kelsey being there and not Kittle. I understand Kelsey grades a little, a little higher. I think Kittle only graded a little lower because he got hurt at some points this year. He's still 29 years old. Kelsey's 33. So if Kittle can play as long in Shanahan's offense, I think – I think Kittle's a home run. I'd probably draft him number two behind Mark Andrews at this point. Again, planning for that three to five years, probably on the closer closer to the three-year three, three year side. 
Um, I liked Firemuth, no problem with that. Um, but yeah, I think I think Pitts and Kelsey are the two um, the two players that I probably mark off and not put in my top five here. Okay. I, yes, that is the direction I wanted to go, and I'll just keep keep it going. I had the same top five as you, Ray, just in a slightly different order. With I had um, I had Pitts as my number two uh, because I do think he's a freakazoid. I think the quarterback situ- situation there is like so not good for him. Like it's a it's a running offense, and they drafted a receiving tight end that's not a blocker, right? Like that's not his strength. It just doesn't really make sense. So. I think that eventually they will draft a quarterback and that situation will change or they'll sign somebody, right? And that situation will change and they'll start leading away from the run. It's that or they're going to go get Lamar and Lamar loves tight ends. So that could be something too. Um, so, so if you're a user here and tight end isn't very deep, so we're, we're kind of tossing around these names. Are we basically saying you have to have one of these six names mentioned, right? Like our top five plus Kittle, maybe throw in Joku in there or else there's a really steep drop off or is Bobby going to, is this where Bobby chimes in here and mentions like Will Disley or something? Maybe like Isaiah Likely or something like that or Gerald Everett. Uh, but yeah, or uh, dude, Harrison Bryant. I don't know if you guys ever heard of him. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so basically it's seven names. You got to grab there, one of the there top are, seven names there. There are seven other guys. guys. But you can get like a Taysom Hill and like, kind of cheat the game a little bit because his passing game is going to count. You know what I mean? But, yeah, for the most part, I agree. It's, it's those seven guys. Dallas Goddard, you know, you can put him in the conversation too, make, make it eight guys. That's a good one. Yeah, I think Goddard, Komet, Jacecki, Fant, Waller. Like, there yeah, are other guys. A bit now. I think there are other guys, you know, that you could get lucky in any year with any one of them. My thing like, with Komet, right, I know you mentioned him as like a slight breakout, mm-hmm. but my thing with him is that offense – we talked again about the quantity and quality of of targets and the volume. I just don't think it's there with the way they're they're structured right now. And so I think, yeah, solid player, well balanced, good blocker. But if he doesn't get that volume, then that's his ceiling, and he's always just going to be kind of a back end starter and not much else. I was hoping one of you guys would say it, and I wouldn't have to, but like Dan Bellinger, you know, he's pretty solid. He's pretty good. He is pretty good. Yeah, he, he is. I, you, there, there were a few rookies that did okay. Like, he's one of them. The guy in Dallas had a few flashes. You said Isaiah Likely. I agree. Isaiah Likely had some flashes when Mark Andrews was, was hurt. So there are guys. Um, it's, just, it's just nothing that, like, you're super confident in. Again, like a receiver position where yeah. there's 15 guys that, like, you just want to go all out and grab. Let's move to center. Final position, guys. 2.9% weight. And uh, Creed Humphrey, kind of in a class of his own. And he makes the, the discussion about ranking stuff, right? Because he's the 23-year-old who, as a rookie, had a 90-plus graded season and just went and did it again. Uh, he has the best QB in the league behind him. They could play together for 10 years, right? So, like, there's, there's nobody more valuable at center than he is. I don't even think it's debatable. Um, it's funny. Every single draft I did last year, I tried to draft him. I would, I'm would i going to do the same thing this year, no doubt about it. Like I want Creed Humphrey on my team. I don't care how you know unvaluable the position is, but that's my guy. Um, and it, it gets interesting after that, right? You got you got undersized rookie Tyler Linderbaum really proving that he can he can last in the NFL. He was our third uh, finisher in all twenty two points, so love to see that for him. Uh, you saw twenty six year old center Frank Rag now finish fourth on our list with a seventy seven point nine season grade, but he did deal with injuries again, and we've seen that now for multiple years. Twenty uh, five year old Connor Williams, we had him as a guard. Next year we will move him to center, uh, but he really he really proved uh, super valuable to that team in Miami, 78.4 season grade there. So love to see that for him. And then a few other young guys really stepped up and solidified themselves in our top 10 scoring this year. That was like Mason Cole out of Pittsburgh, Drew Dolan of Atlanta, another Atlanta guy we're mentioning, Josh Myers in Green Bay, and uh, Sam Mustafer of Chicago. So Bobby, kind of another tough one, but let's wrap out. Uh, wrap up our our series here, talking about your top centers. Yeah, I think I think number one is 
clear cut, really easy decision. And then two through five, you can kind of put them in any order you want. Um, but number one, I have Creed Humphrey. Um, you said it, Chris, he's just absurd. 90 grade this year, 91 run block grade, 79 pass block grade. He can do it all. He's in an offense that's built for the future. It'll be him and Pat Mahomes for the foreseeable future. So love Creed Humphrey. It's He's in a tier of his own. Um, number two, I do have Frank Ragnow. He's still just 26. I understand he has injury history, but I do like that now he's going to have another year in the same system. You saw that um, Detroit's going to keep their offensive coordinator this year. So love to see that for Frank Ragnow. Hopefully it's Jared Goff under center again next year. I, I, can't, I really can't see a reason why he wouldn't be. Um, number three, I have Tyler Linderbaum. The, those two guys graded pretty similar, similarly. I put Ragnow ahead just because we've seen the elite grades from Ragnow, and we just haven't seen it yet from Linderbaum, but he's a rookie, so I, I, I get it. Um, so those two guys you can probably um, interchange. I think Linderbaum's just maybe a, a bigger risk. He's still 22 years old, like I said. Um at number four, I have Connor Williams, another guy who's in a really good offense, 25 years old. Um, and then at five, I have Ethan Posick. He's 27, and he was our third highest graded. He was the third highest graded PFF center with a 79 grade. So, like I said, I think you can kind of mix and match these these last four guys, but I think these are definitely the top five uh, centers in the league. Ray, anybody else you'd want to put in there or anything you'd want to super disagree with? I don't think so, but give you give no. you the opportunity. I think I should have maybe saved my question uh, for this position about, hey, if you don't grab one of the names we mentioned, <laughs> are you basically screwed, right? I think it's this top five. You mentioned Mason Cole, Drew Dahlman, and then it's just a bunch of complete mediocrity that nobody really stands out in uh, at all, right? I, I think... We we're kind of looking and hoping for someone like Josh Myers and Sam Mustafer to really take the next step there. And they, they just, they never really did. They just kind of were there, you know, grading in the, in the sixties, low sixties, mid sixties, just not really taking any next steps. And then the, the coverage just bare. The position is not very well stacked. So I think you either get one of these five names or you get a Mason Cole or Drew Dahlman or, you really don't address this position until very late in the draft because there's no one worth really taking for a while after these guys. But as far as the top five list goes, I have no real disagreements. Maybe I move Connor Williams above Tyler Linderbaum, even though Linderbaum is really young. I think he's kind of maxed out physically and like he's, he's already at his ceiling or very close to it just because he's just naturally small and, and doesn't have a big frame or great strength or anything. He just kind of is what he is, despite being what twenty two years old. But outside of that, yeah, I think I think this top five is exactly how I would have it. And you better grab one of those other two names, or else just go ahead and stack up depth elsewhere, and then just circle back really late to I guess fill out your your center for the rest of your depth chart after. I thought you were gonna fry me for having Linderbaum below Ragnow, but you want him even lower. Because you think he reaches oh, yeah. potential already. Wow. Right now is an, an inaugural draft pick for me, and he he played for my team with like a broken throat. So he's he's always going to get the, the benefit of the doubt for me. <laughs> right. I also had Linderbaum as my number three, so I, I agree with you there. I think there are three other guys that we, we didn't mention because they're older guys, and I think that they can help you win. Uh, so like guys that I wouldn't take early, but I wouldn't wait till the end of the draft to grab them. Uh, and that's Jason Kelsey if he comes back. I think the question the question there is if they win, right? If they end up making it to deep in the playoffs, he might just call it a day. So um, Jason Kelsey is a guy I would definitely trust to uh, to do well for my team. Connor McGovern's another guy on the Jets, and then Corey Lindsay, right? He's a he's a vet that's done it for a long time, um, and he's proven that he can have that high end potential. So guys that you might want to just grab if you miss out on this group uh, to help you just just win, right? And those were actually my six, seven, and eight because after that, it's like a wasteland and, and any one is as good as any other one. But okay, that's it, guys. So we talked about the offense, the complete 
uh, the top finishers of our, of our all 22 inaugural season on offense. That was super exciting. We talked about what we're expecting for the mock draft rankings, showed you a little bit behind the curtains on that. Um, and we, we hope to have that out to you soon. But thank you all for tuning in. If you haven't yet, please give us a follow on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at all22 underscore PFF and leave a review for our podcast on YouTube, Apple, or whichever platform you use. Thanks for tuning in. I'm a ghost.